Hi and welcome to episode four of SAS Leaders Lounge. Today I have a very special guest, Sarah Jones. Um, many of you might know she's a pre-sales expert with many years of experience at some of the top companies globally. And she's been able to lead some amazing initiatives. And Sarah, I'd love you just to say hello to the guests and uh, introduce yourself formally. Thanks so much, Paris. Hi, everybody. I'm Sarah Jones. I've been in pre-sales uh, my whole life. I am definitely a pre-sales lifer. Um, I started my career in a small software maintenance management company uh, back in England that got taken over by an American company. And that prompted a move over to America. Um, and from there, I joined SAP when it was quite a young company internationally. Um, I actually joined a subsidiary of SAP uh, SAP America Public Sector, where I did um, an individual contributor role for nine years, building the business for SAP in the public sector space in the States. Uh, and then I uh, moved into different leadership roles. Um, so I've been so fortunate through SAP to have had a new role every few mm -hmm. years um, that made it seem like I didn't spend 24 years with the company. Um, and getting to experience lots of different aspects of a large corporation. So managing teams that supported the channel, managing teams that supported the most strategic customers, managing teams that supported our, our strategic industries, managing teams that um, were in a geographic sector. Um, I did a transformation assignment in China, um, and that was uh, hugely exciting. Um, and a really big challenge as part of my career. Uh, and then um, right as uh, I was thinking about leaving SAP, my last stint there was managing the line of business for customer experience, um, the team that supported that, both uh, back office functions as well as all of the field pre-sales. And then the last couple of years, um, I've been at Zendesk. And um, now I am currently on sabbatical, which I am very much enjoying. That's great. And I guess in those early years in your career, when you first got into to pre-sales as it was, it was, you know, probably a, a very undefined role. And, and for many, it was a new, a new role, a new chapter, clearly not something that you knew a lot about. And what prompted you to kind of take that gamble and, and move into that, that role as it was? And, and in the early days, I guess it was a male dominated role. How was you able to adapt and, you know, hit the ground running effectively? Yes, I was the first female in a team uh, when I came over to America with the with the software acquisition. Um, and it was quite the uh, challenge, I think, for my male team members to realize that, oh, there's a female in the room now. Perhaps we have to temper a little bit um, what we what we discuss, you know, the locker room conversations um, and then really uh, get used to having somebody who, who was a little different, uh, bringing that diversity aspect into, into the, into the team. Um, so yeah, that was, that was quite fun. Um, and I remember when I first joined SAP, um, my title was product engineer. So I was, we were all known as PEs. So I, I, you're right about the, the evol evolution of the role. Um, I, I discovered very early on that, um, I really loved presenting and demoing. Um, I loved being in front of the customer. I loved seeing the light bulb effect of the customer when they got that, oh my God, technology is actually going to help me solve something. Um, and I loved that feeling from my perspective of this is really cool. I like being able to solve problems basically using technology. Um, and so, yeah, the, the role has definitely evolved from being very, very demo focused, which is what, where I started to being a whole lot more now. Um, Pre-sales is a very strategic and valuable member of the go to market team. Um, and the demo is just a very small segment of what the role is. That's great. And on today's episode, I guess my focus, given your your background and your extensive experience in, you know, even promoting the, the value selling pieces, you know, value selling versus product feature selling and 
looking at customer experience and the enablement piece as well, both from the customer and, and uh, uh, internal perspective. So as as we look back to the early days in pre-sales to, to now, you mentioned that the, the focus has changed, but for you personally, how have you seen that impact the customers and how has the customer's needs changed to, to enable the value selling piece to be more critical than ever to success in, in, in go-to-market teams? Oh, that is such a great question. Um, in the early days, I think uh, the customers that were buying technology, uh, especially ERP technology, if you think back, you know, when I was first joining SAP, that was definitely an ERP um, solution for businesses to actually run their business. And um, they were not very educated on what technology could do. So there was quite a lot of demoing and presentations around that aspect. Um, I think that, that over time, uh, the customers have most definitely got more intelligent, right? So they do a lot more of the research about what technology can do for them to solve a problem. Uh, they're researching your organization before they're even picking up the phone to talk to you now. And they're listening to other customers. They're listening to analysts. They're, they might even be out playing with your software if you've got trial stuff up on, on an internet um, uh, capability. Uh, so they're a, a lot more intelligent and they're coming to the table with um, many more questions now about the relationship with you as a vendor. So it's not just the software that you need to be selling them on. It's actually, hey, I'm going to need somebody who's going to help me through this. You know, we're going through internal transformations. That's why we're buying technology. We've got big problems to solve. That's why we're buying technology. And I believe that the role of the pre-sales person now is to tie that all up in a nice package for them which means that you're not just demoing anymore. You most definitely have to value sell. You have to value sell against expected outcomes for the customer and they will change. Expected outcomes could be, I want to be more competitive. I want to reduce my, my costs. I want to increase my penetration. I want to have an impact on my customer satisfaction score. Whatever it is that those metrics are that the customer has identified, you have to be able to know enough about your software solution, enough about the industry, and enough about business to be able to put that all together into a meaningful, simple, memorable message back to the customer. So they most definitely have to um, feel like you're in it with them for that journey. And you can only do that if you can prove out the value of investing in this technology solution for them. So I think that, you know, when you when you look at where pre-sales first started, for me, at least 20, 25 years ago, um, it was all about the demo. The customer was like, wow, I, I know absolutely nothing. All I know is, is that I need to click a few buttons and, and here's the outcome. Um, and today it's a very, very different um, playing field. So yeah, it's, uh, I, I definitely, I, I love the evolution of where we're going. I think pre-sales are adding so much more value. We do so much more of all of that, collecting the metrics, mapping it back to our solution, cross-referencing that back with our other customers that we have so that we can ballpark it. We know we can talk intelligently. We can give examples about what other customers are doing. Um, and, and it's all really tied up into what is the desired outcome for the customer and how do we make sure that you get it? I guess a lot of the content you've been posting recently on LinkedIn has been really, you know, I've immersed myself in it. And I guess a lot of people have Damien and, and a few other people that you, you and me both speak to frequently. And I guess something that always comes up and I think is really important to, to dive a little bit deeper into for the audience is, you talked, you spoke about the intelligent part of understanding the needs and what they're trying to achieve. But I guess to be able to do that, to be a successful, you know, SE or pre-sales specialist, it's about understanding the why. And how would you say for somebody moving into to pre-sales, because there's a lot of people that, you know, don't really know what it is, or if they do, they want to improve their skills and get better at it. And how would you say is the best way for them to really 
understand the whys of the customers and ask those highly intelligent technical questions that help the customer also to gauge that that level of trust and feel, hey, this, this person's actually going to be a trusted advisor and follow us on this journey and really know what we want. They're not just trying to sell us a product based on the needs of, of what the product can achieve, but really on what we're trying to achieve and align that to our transformation and effectively their customer journey. Yeah, that um, the, the why, the start, if, if, if anyone hasn't read it, you should all read Simon Sinek, Start With Why. That is such a great book where he really does talk about the importance of why um, it for, for mankind, humankind. So um, a great book to start with. I am a huge fan of uh, pre-sales creating trusted relationships with their customer. And you can only do that if you're curious about them. So for somebody starting off or wanting to transition into pre-sales, one of those traits that I think is so important is that natural curiosity. It's the ability to want to learn about your solution for a start. It's the ability to be curious about what your customer is trying to solve. Um, and from there, you can put the two things together. Um, so in discovery, you're not you're not asking questions to prep for a demo. So here's, here's the difference between tactical discovery and strategic discovery. Tactical discovery is, okay, I know the customer wants to see this business process. Now I'm going to ask them a bunch of customers about the data so that I can populate my demo system to build a demo. So, and, and while that data is useful for a demonstration and a presentation back to the customer, it doesn't bring you to a trusted status. It, in fact, it might not even build credibility for you um, as an individual with that customer. What does build the credibility and the trust is you asking questions that are much more aligned to the problems that they're trying to solve. So, um, and that requires a lot of, of listening. So you're going to be asking open-ended questions around this. So Tell me about your current situation. What is it that you're trying to, to do with your current business process? And then just shut up and listen and take a ton of notes. And from there, the customer will give you different little rabbit holes that you can dive down into to be able to ask more probing questions. Um, so, for example, you might um, find that the customer is actually trying to um, increase their customer satisfaction score. Let's keep it around customer experience. Um, and so you, and then you're asking some questions and you'll find out that the customer, all the customer is doing right now is just sending out a survey with, you know, one or two questions, maybe a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Um, and that's not really resonating with the customer's data of actually trying to find out where are our issues from our customer's customer point of view. So that then gives you the ability to be able to say, well, have you looked at other data? So, for example, if we look at your return service, do you know why people are returning your product or are complaining about your service? And then again, shut up and listen. And from there, you'll get other questions. And so collecting all of that um, surrounding type of data allows you to be able to drill down further and further and you will get to the why of what the customer is trying to trying to do. Um, so discovery, that's strategic discovery. That is actually where you are aligned to the challenge, the opportunity ahead, and you are making sure that your questions are going to get to enough information for you, A, to prep for a demo, but more importantly, for you to be able to come back with the value and the business case of, here's why you should go with me. Here's why you should partner with me and my solution, because we're going to be able to help you solve this, this and this, which will lead to this benefit, this gain, this measurable outcome, this cost savings, this cost benefit. So you're tying then the benefits of your solution back to bottom line stuff that your customer can then take to the CEO to get signed off for a contract. Perfect. You said and. 
I guess when we, you know, shift the conversation towards, you know, the demo piece, which is something that in pre-sales, a lot of people try to home in and focus on really and truly, if you've done all of these things, as you mentioned in the right way, by the time you're at the demo stage, really it's, you know, as, as you said previously, the icing on the cake, right? It should be, yeah. they're already engaged. They know the product will meet the needs that they have. They, they're confident in what they can achieve working with yourself and the product. And now it's the formalities of, you know, the contract and just presented a demo to the C-level. Um, if we shift, you know, away from the demo discussion for a second, I just wanted to ask you, how have you, as as a leader, when you, you move from being an IC into a leadership role, how was you able to use those experiences you had in the field to kind of develop these initiatives to really home in and focus on, you know, the the, the value selling rather than the feature selling, because I guess every company will have their mandate and their focus, what they want, to, how they want to go about, you know, selling the product and how have you been able to impact and influence that? Because, you know, in a leadership role, you don't want to just be a, a follower, but a leader and somebody that can shape and change things. Yeah, that's um, another great question. Thank you, Paris. Uh, I am more concerned around enablement for um, those types of skills for pre-sales. Um, so as a leader, I'm very keen that everybody is enabled in how do we do effective discovery. Um, I think that really good, successful sales engagements come from really good, successful discovery. Um, um, and being able to do that in a strategic way, like I just talked about, versus the tactical way is key. Um, so as a leader, most definitely focused in on making sure that you've got a pre-sales team that it feels confident in being able to do those discovery um, cycles with a customer that is done in that strategic way versus tactical. So, you know, that's one of the things um, to, to level up the team. Um, the, the other thing I think to think about is uh, the other business skills that go in with solidifying a deal. So how do you how do you weave in the references? How do you how how do you tell the story basically? So how do you get upskilled on what other customers of your solution are doing and the benefits that they're receiving? Um, that's a key important criteria. Um, uh, some of the best presentations that I've seen of, of demo software are, are, I'm gonna sneeze, excuse me. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> um, some of the best no demo um, um, presentations that I have seen, there's been very little software sold, very little software that has been demoed. Um, and this is because the, the, the pre-sales person in question has done awesome discovery. So they've already built that really solid relationship with the customer and given them a comfort level that we're already going to be a good partner. So you've built some of that trust. And once you start building trust, there's less to physically prove. Um, and, and then moving into um, the, the demo where you've got all of this information that you've gathered, you're, you're weaving it in with stories from other customers. You're being able to drop in different business metrics um, so ABC Corporation saved 10% in their um, in their processing costs, um, whatever it is that you're 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 doing. And then um, and let me show you how that looks, you know, with a very quick dive down into the software. So being able to enable pre-sales people to have that type of a customer engagement is key. And from a perspective of the team, while we're we're talking about enablement and how what what have been some of the key in initiatives because there will be other leaders and a lot of people that ask me questions about you know initiatives that leaders could implement and introduce to their organization so what were some of the key if you look back at your time at sap and, and even zendesk what key initiatives that you introduced for the team to be able to monitor um, and for them to also realize some some responsibility and some you know growth opportunity within the company and feel like they're being enabled and given the freedom to succeed i i love it when pre-sales the creative innovation side of pre-sales comes out uh, i love it when you're seeing how can you best be memorable to a customer especially if you're in a deep 
um, evaluation cycle and there may be, you know, four or five other software vendors that the customer's looking at and you, you want to stand out. So I love it when um, pre-sales people are given the flexibility and the freedom um, and are not being micromanaged to be able to explore that um, and you know, try something new um, and fail fast, um, but win quick. So I'll give you an example. Um, at SAP, we were um, just starting to experiment with video um, and doing different things with animation, um, self-service type of demos, uh, leave behind demos, door opener type of demos that would really help the salespeople. Um, so one of the initiatives that, that uh, we executed was around that. So we had some very creative, innovative people who were using um, different types of software tools to make you know, cartoon versions of software processes, um, three minute, five minute types of video clips that we could uh, put in the hands of the salespeople that they could then use when they're in the qualification stage or they could then use to follow up after um, any of the, the meetings that they had had with the customer. Um, and, and so things like that, I think, are important for leaders to be able to have the confidence in their team that they are going to want to be able to do some things differently every now and then um, and have the freedom and flexibility to be able to try that. Um, so we had we had a couple of failures with the animation. It got, got way too cartoony um, and, and, and didn't look very professional, you know, so. You know, we recognized that very quickly and pulled back um, and found some other tools that were allowed us to do animation, but not in so much of a, um, a Simpsons flavor, you know, things like that. Um, so I really do think that as pre-sales leaders, you're trying to ensure that for your pre-sales team, that they're challenged, that they're stretched, that they feel like that they are contributing um, and they're closing business because obviously revenue is king at the end of the day uh, and that they're having fun doing it. Uh, and so le leaders should really be focused on those types of initiatives that check all of those boxes. Um, so, you know, get creative with the way that you enable teams, get creative with the way that you onboard, you, you know, have buddy systems, have shadow systems, create competitions internally around enablement, who can get on the leaderboard first, who can close the, the, the first deal for a brand new release of the software or, or from an acquired piece of software. There's a ton of things that you can do that really help to build your pre-sales brand within the organization um, and, and make it a fun place to be. Um, you know, pre-sales is so much fun. In no two days are the same. Um, and you should really elevate that within your organization and within your team. And to be honest, I don't think there's really anyone in pre-sales that I've personally spoken to that said, hey, I do this job, it's called pre-sales and I really don't enjoy it. It's not like sales where, you know, you speak to a lot of people and they love it. You speak to some people and it's not, it's, you know, it's from some days it's good when they're winning and when they're not winning, you know, they're not enjoying it so much. But something that we both know, you know, is that all, all of the failures are highlighted very quickly. The successes, maybe not so much. Um, and in terms of failures, were there, was there anything that you would say as a leader, whether that's in the early days or even till, you know, your, your last stint at Zendesk, where there was something that you took a chance on and tried and maybe it didn't work out? And, and what would you, how would you have learned and remedied that if you had to do it all over again? Um, what, I know that when I was first in management, I definitely failed at building the right relationships with other stakeholders outside of pre-sales that matter. Um, as a pre-sales leader, you are representing your team to leadership, maybe to execs. It depends on what level you are. Uh, you need to be able to have those right kind of relationships. I most definitely did not have um, that early on in my career. Uh, um, and that's, that's, that hurts everybody, right? It hurts you as a leader because you're not 
building your own brand and reputation within the organization, but it also hurts your team because you're not promoting them. You're not talking about how successful they are. You're not putting them on people's radar screens for development opportunities for career growth because you haven't created those relationships. Um, so luckily I had a, a great HR business partner at SAP and I also had a great first manager. Um, and so, you know, after I had realized that, hey, my team's not getting any recognition and, and it, you know, I see all of these other people getting kudos. Um, so getting the coaching from my HR business partner and uh, my manager, I know I realized very early on, OK, stakeholder ownership matters. And and I had a guest actually um, earlier on today who had a question which I, I, I would love to position to you because it's it's actually on that piece of mentorship. So it, how do you define what the type, the right type of mentor would be for yourself and how do you go about doing that? We know networking is important, but finding, a, a, a you know, somebody who can mentor you with the right balance of skills that can complement the areas that maybe you're missing or need to um, upskill in. Yeah. So there's different types of mentors, right? There's people who you want in your life for a long time. Um, um, and maybe this might, it might be a college professor, for example, who you've got a really good relationship with um, at, from university and you keep that going for the rest of your life. And there's somebody who you bounce ideas off of. Um, I have a, a, a couple of people I, on my personal board of directors is how I refer to it. So there's people from... Um, my working career, who I trust their judgment, I trust their information, I trust their advice. Um, and whenever I'm struggling with something, those people um, are sounding boards for me. They really help to talk through an issue or a challenge that I'm having. Um, and it's reciprocal, right? So, so they it's a two way street. So I'm also giving that information back whenever it is asked. Um, yeah. There's a very small handful of people that do that for me um, and will do that for you in your life. Um, and they'll come from all sorts of different walks of life. It might not necessarily be within your own organization. The other types of mentors are for for seasons in your life. Um, so it might be that you are um, an, you're an aspiring people leader within the pre-sales organization. So you have got an active development plan. You've been working with your manager. Uh, you know you, your next step is you, you want to move into people leadership. Um, and you want to be mentored to help get you there. So it's a seasonal thing, right? You, so you've got the support from your manager, but it's always great to look out across your organization or anywhere, actually. If you see somebody on LinkedIn who you really admire, hit them up. So, so here's where you're going outside of the pre-sales organization. You've, you've identified somebody who you think is a really good leader. You admire the traits that they do. You admire how they lead their team. Um, you can reach out to them and say, hey, this is, this is what I'm struggling with right now. I'm trying to get over that hurdle to break into people leadership. You know, I've got a development plan with my manager. Um, would it be OK if, if, if I asked you for some advice about this as I'm, I'm on this journey over the next six, nine months? So you're putting some time frames around it for the person you're reaching out to. You've got some very clear goals of what it is that you're asking for from that mentor. And they are going to be able to um, work with you. And, and then it's one and done. Right. So you had a challenge. You found somebody you admired who took that challenge or faces that challenge and does it remarkably well and you want to learn from them. Um, so, and you need to blend, you need to have a blend of people in your life for that because there will always be situational challenges that you're trying to resolve and you can't do it on your own. Um, and maybe your manager is not the best person to help you with that. So it is good to go outside and get a different perspective um, for, for things like that. And then there will be people who are, much more trusted advisors to you um, that will help you at every stage or with every challenge or with every initiative that you're trying to do. So it's a it's a good blend. And on and on the note of you know mentors and, and networking, we we both 
a part of the Presos Collective, and and I, we've also spoken, you know, in the past about your your role in chief. And I just love to dive a little bit more into how involved you are in these initiatives and how important, you know, the, the networking is within the Presos Collective and also chief to you personally and also to the wider um, people within that community to be able to collaborate and network and exchange problems and initiatives and enhance their learning and elevate to the next level. Networking is absolutely key if you want to be able to grow your career uh, and grow your brand and grow your reputation. Uh, um, I absolutely love the Pre-Sales Collective. Um, I, uh, James and uh, EG, who created that several years ago, um, have really helped to elevate what pre-sales means in tech. Uh, it is a great place for uh, pre-sales individual contributors to be able to hear from their peers, hear what other companies are doing within pre-sales so that they can bring examples back. Uh, the Leadership Collective is a fabulous place full of so much talent um, and so many people who are doing really good things to evolve the pre-sales role. Um, so you're not in isolation. You're not you're not in a vacuum trying to think of, OK, how do, how do I how do I solve this challenge within my company? Because there'll be somebody out there who's already done it or who's already working on it. Um, so from all aspects of that, the, the pre-sales collective is a fantastic organization. If you are in pre-sales, you most definitely need to be a member. Um, there are, I've met some awesome people. There's been some great net, local networking events that have taken place um, with the pre-sales collective. So it's really um, excellent to be able to meet people face to face and have conversations, um, have a laugh, have a drink. Um, and then, you know, just talk a little bit about what, what pre-sales is. Um, and you never know, somebody you network with like that might well end up becoming your next manager or you might be managing them. <laughs> so networking is um, is absolutely key for all of those aspects. Um, and then um, Chief. So for those of people who don't know, Chief is a um, is a female executive networking group. Um, I've been a member for a couple of years now, and it has been hugely beneficial to talk to other women in business. Um, and so nobody in the Chief group is in pre-sales. Um, nobody in they have little core groups. Um, where you meet very regularly and nobody in my core group is in tech. Uh, so it has been um, one of the best things about that is there are business challenges that are faced no matter what your industry is. So in my core group, there's um, people from um, insurance, from advertising, from marketing, uh, from the, med the medical world. And, um, uh, oh, I forget. I forget where the last lady's from, but it's it, nobody is from tech. So we all bring different perspectives to the challenges that women face in, in business. So Chief was created primarily to help women um, get seats at that exec table. Um, and it is um, been a fantastic journey to, to be with Chief on with this, um, uh, with the help and support that you get from other women. Who are facing very similar challenges even though they're not in tech and they're not in pre-sales and even at your time at sap when you was you know made the, the global vp of of the customer experience unit even at that time i guess there wasn't too many uh, women leaders in pre-sales or maybe in in wider yes there was but in pre-sales it was relatively unknown and how was you able to get buy in i know by that time you'd had you know many years of success at sap when you sit at the top table with some of these real real senior executives across the globe, how were you able to really get buy into some of the you know key initiatives that you had and, and the visions that you had for the department? Uh, so that all comes down to networking. Uh, I think that w where I if I look back when I first started in pre-sales and there were so few women uh, and there were so few women individual contributors when I first started at SAP, we would go to sales kickoff meetings and I'd look across the room and there would be maybe 10, 15 percent women. Uh, and now I'm seeing I'm so thankful that it is a career path that women want to get into uh, because it's so much fun. It's, you know, who, who wants to work at a boring job? It's like, come and have fun. Pre-sales is the best job in tech. Um, but we're still underrepresented 
underrepresented. You know, I think the numbers, the last numbers I saw, I, I think we make up about 38 percent of of um, the pre-sales industry, I think was the last statistic I saw. So, you know, when we're still a ways off from 50-50. And then when you get into leadership, the numbers just plummet. It is, it's, it's even, you know, less than 20% uh, female representation. Um, and, and then looking across all aspects of diversity, it gets even worse when you're bringing in all other elements um, across the yeah. DEI and i um, spectrum. But this is definitely something, an area that I'm passionate about and want to grow. I do want to see women want to take that career path and grow into uh, leadership positions. Um, I'd love to see the pre-sales organization um, globally within the tech world be more diverse. It is something that is is near and dear to my heart as I'm, you know, coming to the end of my career here. Uh, I I definitely want to be able to bring in that that talent that is underrepresented. And I, I agree that there's there is a, a lower level there of of women that are are in pre sales. But I guess something I read the other day, which was interesting, was that when when candidates apply to a job, a, a, a female is more likely to say, "Oh, I don't meet this one or two requirements," and they won't apply for a job. There is a man may say, "Okay, well, I don't fit two of these criteria, but I'm still going to apply anyway." So it's a more reserved approach to applying for these jobs when really like we all know there is no ideal candidate for a job and if you are the ideal candidate you're probably overqualified right you want so you want a range of different people in pre-sales that can come in and bring different skills so you can lean on each other and leverage those skills and build a great team if everyone has the same skills then it's not really going to work right so this is something that when i speak to people i always try to promote you know you, you don't want to be the same as the next person you want to bring a unique set of skills. Yes, the fundamentals of soft skills, communication, being able to sell, tell a unique user story or story, whether that's about your career, a challenge you face. This is what, you know, pre-sales is about, right? Telling a unique story and being able to tell a story that engages the reader, the audience. So try to be different, but don't don't be scared if you don't meet, meet everything on a job spec because the job specs are always changing. And this was something on, on the pre-sales collective. There was like a leadership meeting recently and they were talking about that very topic that, you know, it's requirements are changing. How has your requirements changed over time from, you know, what you maybe needed at the early starts when you was a manager of pre-sales to when you went to China and, and back to the US? The requirements change, right? And how has that been been the case for you? If, if you're hiring for um, an architect, you do need the technical, you do need the deep skills, you do need somebody who is um, um, really well versed in all of that. It's, that's, that is a specialized skill um, within the tech world. Um, yeah, and you definitely are looking for somebody who, who has got some of, some of those attributes. Um, for, for somebody who is trying to break into pre-sales, I think that the raw the raw skills are much more important. Um, demonstrate to me that you're a team player. Show me where you've worked well in a team or what the outcomes were. Um, explain to me how you've learned something new within the last three months and, and, and how you went about that. I want to know that you're a lifelong learner, that, that curiosity displays. Um, talk to me about the last time you helped a customer. Um, and it doesn't matter whether you were working in a retail store and you were helping to fit somebody with shoes you know, I, yeah. I want to hear about those types of things and the approach that you took so that I know what your listening skills are like with the customer and how you can then turn what you heard from the customer into a result. Um, I want to know that you can present well. Um, and it doesn't matter if you don't have experience on that before. Um, you know, just show me how you would be in front of a, a customer. Um, and so so those types of raw skills are the things that I'm much more interested in now than are you do you have pre-sales experience and i guess now you've 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 had a number of different roles leading teams you're able to adapt and use those skills and experiences from hiring previously to have that flexibility there is maybe earlier in your career you were you know so passionate to find people that had already done it 
So you didn't have to spend so much time on the onboarding and worry about, are they going to succeed in this role? Is it the right role for them? You know, it's when you've got that years of experience leading teams, you, you kind of get to know what you, what's important in hiring, right? And yes. building, the, when you're interviewing people for these positions, as you said, really uncovering some of these key skills by asking these questions about how were you able to solve this problem? What did you learn from this? What did you take? How did you evaluate? It gives you a chance to, to understand the, the person. And as a, a high level executive, when you're maybe even hiring into the leadership pre-sales team, do you find engaging with them directly is, is useful rather than relying on talent acquisition or HR to reach out to these people? I, I always find when people, you know, engage directly, it's, it's a lot more personal. So if, for example, you reached out to me and said, hey, Paris, I'd, I'd love to have you in my team leading X, Y, and Z regions, it's more likely that even if I'm not looking now, I would engage with you and say, hey, so I'm not looking now, but I appreciate you reaching out. And if anything does change, I would love to get in touch as, as a respect to, in respect to somebody saying, hi, I work for uh, in HR, and you know, it's not a very personalized message. Just, you know, we're hiring for this position. Thought you'd be a fit. Do you fancy having a chat? Have you had the time or invested in doing some of that outreach to, to people you've tried to hire before? And it goes back to networking, I guess. Yes. I was just about to say it all goes back to networking. <laughs> um, and, and not only that, but if you then hear about a role that you think would be good for somebody, um, um, and this just happened to me. Somebody reached out on my network I uh, and, and reached out and said, hey, I have a friend who's about to leave their job. Um, I think this would be a good fit for you. Would you like me to hook you up with the with the hiring manager? Um, and, and I was so grateful for that. It was like, OK, this person I knew through my network uh, had thought about me uh, for that position. And so it then is proactively positioning. That's what you want to have happen in your career. You want people to be advocating for yourself um, and really promoting you, um, knowing about you, so that you you you've got some you you've got your own board of directors um, to help you with your career growth and your career development. Um, so yeah, networking, 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 networking. <laughs> Perfect. And, and and on the note of development, how was you able to focus when you was, you know, building out teams? How were you able to focus on developing performance plans for the team? And how did that help them in turn to be value champions and, and for you to be able to bring total harmony in the team? Because it's, you know, crucial for leaders to retain their team members and make sure that they're happy to come to work and do their job. And then we can, you know, dive into the remote because I know remote's going to play a big part and it has done. In, in recent years and people's ability to, how I would say, integrate work-life balance rather than calling it the work-life balance? Yes. Um, okay, so the first part of that um, around uh, development plans and, and um, making sure that everybody has um, got a career path. Uh, so one of the really cool things about the pre-sales role is there are a ton of different ways that you can go from this when you want to do something different. Um, that, so I have worked with people and helped people move into product roles, uh, people who want to move into marketing, people who want to move into pure sales roles, um, people who want to be able to do something around operations. There are so many different career paths that are open to you. You don't just have to look at pre-sales and say, okay, now I want to be a people manager and move up the chain that way. It's actually more like a spider's web where you can go off on, on, on different um, angles um, according to what drives you. So, you know, different pre-sales people um, have different strengths that they bring to the team. So some people are much more salesy. Some people are much more techy. Um, and that then drives where you want to build a development plan for, for your individuals to be able to uh, move into um, if that's their desired outcome. Um, so that's such a cool thing about pre-sales. I love it when I see pre-sales people. When I look back, I you know, I, people I started working with um, 25 plus years ago in pre-sales, they are all over SAP. They're in so many different roles now. And it's just amazing to see that, that pre-sales was the foundation of their career and it helped them. But they're all doing so many different things. It's um, It's been a 
um, a joy to be able to watch that. And it's a joy to be able to build development plans for people, knowing that they have so many choices from a role within pre-sales. Um, and then the other thing I think around building development plans is, is working very closely with um, your leadership team. So uh, this is not just, it's your boss. It may be the COO, it's the CRO uh, and uh, operations, uh, marketing and product, because you want to know what the direction of the company is. You want to know what the direction of the solution is. You want to know where the company is placing its bets for the next 12, 18 months. Um, and, and longer term for longer term development plans, because you want to be able to factor that in as a part of the growth. You want to make sure that your team is aligned to what your customer is trying to achieve from that strategic point of view um, and what the CRO is hoping to achieve from a numbers point of view. So, you, you know, there's a lot of things you have to back into from that. So, you know, a balanced development plan is key. It, it will have um, a lot of those key core in, um, initiatives. Um, and action items that you need to be able to be measured against for the year. But it will most definitely have the individual component, depending on where that pre-sales person wants to go. Amazing. And so a topic that's been playing on my mind for a while and, and something that I, I heard quite a while ago as part of a discussion, which I wanted to get your thoughts on is as pre-sales has become more and more important in, in go-to-market organizations in the wider business, how are pre-sales leaders at the top level able to really get a seat at that, you know, real executive table where, you know, the CRO and the CEO sits? How how can you best, if you are a global VP or, or a high level leadership position, how can you really get buy-in from them to say, look, you know, our, our opinions are important and being able to drive the growth and the strategy and the revenue that you're trying to achieve because, you know, sales are always paired, pre-sales are always paired, sorry, with, with sales guys. And expected to achieve results but as a trusted advisor you need to be able to you know have a seat at the table to share the feedback who's closer to the customers than you guys yeah that is uh that is a great challenge um and one that <laughs> i hope before i retire pre-sales does have a seat next to the cro instead of under the cro uh i i am very very keen that it is an equal relationship, the pre-sales and sales, it, it is, I, I always refer to it as a marriage and not a parent child. Um, and as long as pre-sales is reporting into uh, the sales organization, it, it, it is, it's a little bit more parent child than it is a marriage. Um, I, I think that, you know, I joked the other day that if pre-sales went on strike, then it, the, the whole uh, tech industry would absolutely know the value that pre-sales brings to the table, but that is not going to happen. Um, and I think it it will boil down again to networking, networking, networking. It is absolutely making sure that you are, as a leader and as an executive leader, you're promoting your team. You are bringing good ideas to the table. You are leveraging your network to be able to have a voice and, and have a seat. Um, and and really try to expand on that um, um, and prove out the value that the pre-sales organization brings um, to the go-to-market motion for, for the organization. Thank you, Sarah. And just two, two more questions, if, if you don't mind me asking. One is one that really intrigues me, and I guess many people with families would understand this. How has remote working been you know, a major influence in, in the success of teams um, that you've managed and, and do, are you a, a huge advocate of it, you know, fully remote roles or do you think having a hybrid model is, is maybe more efficient for teams depending on where yeah. they are in their stage? Well, we didn't have very much of a choice in recent years with the, the fully remote <laughs> uh, option, uh, which, which was a, a, a very challenging environment to be in to try and manage uh, morale motivation inspiration keep that going it's very difficult to do that when you're in in 2d mode versus 3d mode i uh, i am a huge fan of remote uh, especially if you have um, geographically dispersed teams um, and that can just be geographically dispersed within a state it doesn't necessarily have to be um, geographically dispersed across a, a region 
Um, you know, even in the UK, it's it's it would be quite a commute from somebody from Manchester to come into London into the office every day. So, you know, I am a big fan of remote for things like that. Uh, however, I do believe pre- pre-sales is a team sport, as I said earlier. <coughs> and pre-sales need to be able to get together. Pre-sales, the very best pre-sales are collaborative. They're sharing, they're caring. And to be able to do that effectively, you have to be together. You have to be in a room. Um, the best enablement takes place when it's hands-on with people um, rather than sitting behind a, a remote screen just trying to check off all the little green check marks as you process through. Some of the best enablement comes when you've got product in the in the room. Um, they're able to answer. You're trying to break the, the software. You've got product there in the room who are helping you. <laughs> so hybrid is is definitely the way that I would love to work. And and the last question before we dive into some quick fire questions and, and a question from my last guest would be when, you know, the opportunity first came up when you was in, you know, the early years of your career to move to, to the US and, and to move to China, I guess by that by that time you had met your your to be husband and, and maybe if you had kids at that point. How how was that decision taken? Um, and how important was it to have, you know, a great support network when you decided to take on those international assignments? And did you develop a lot of key skills that you wouldn't have got if you hadn't taken that challenge on? Yeah, um, I'm very fortunate that I do have a very supportive hubby. And he we have always made big decisions very, very rapidly. So when I came home from work and I told him, um, Hey, I, I've just heard from my manager that they want me to move to America. What do you think about that? Um, and he said, yep, sounds good to me. So we made the decision like that. And then it was just working out the logistics to go. And then he, of course, has been super supportive through all of that. Um, and then I was actually in a meeting in Germany when I was asked if I would do the China assignment. Um, and so I phoned him from the break and I said, hey, um, We've just been asked if we would consider an assignment in China, in Shanghai. <coughs> and he said, yep, sounds good to me. <laughs> so I went back into the meeting and I said, yeah, we're in. So the big decisions we make like that. And then um, and then we support each other. For the China move, we had to take two very young kids. They were um, six and four at the time. Um, so we just made it an adventure, a whole family adventure for them. And and I guess the, the working in in companies and 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 co- with, with sorry within countries and companies with very different cultures, I guess you had to adapt and learn a lot of different things from your time in these different organisations and and regions. Of course, they do things differently. Businesses conducted differently. Was there a lot of big takeaways that you learned and helped you in your leadership journey, taking on those assignments? Uh. Yeah, I think the biggest takeaway is that it doesn't matter what part of the world you're in, you're a human being and people are very are more similar than we are not. Everybody laughs at like funny cat videos. That was the joke that I used to make. Um, and it doesn't matter whether you're Chinese or Japanese, Korean, American, British, Brazilian. You know, if you see a funny cat video, you're going to laugh at it. You're going to cry at a sad story. So people are people are, are human beings that are driven by some of the same fundamental things in life. And I think if you align to that and remember that and are empathetic with that, um, you you can build very successful teams. It's it's having that empathy. It's caring about people. It's wanting to know that each team member that you have on your team has a life and they are working to support that life and you want them to be the very best person at work therefore everything else in their life needs to be to be stable and supported so and you need to be interested in that you need to you need to know what is driving your team um each individual is driven by different things. Some people get a real buzz about being recognized on a stage. Some people get a real buzz by getting a huge bonus check. 
some people get a real buzz if they have accomplished something really well and they're mentioned in a newsletter. There's a ton of different ways that people love to be recognized and rewarded. And it's knowing what it is that drives your team members um, to build that successful team um, and to build the empathy. So that was that was probably the, the biggest takeaway that I have got from living and working in different parts of the world is we, we are a wonderful human race and we are all so similar and we should all be embracing that. Agreed. And like you said, uh, it's important to know the team that you, you work with and you support to really understand what drives them. I was watching something not too long ago and I heard where there was a situation where somebody was saying, hey, I've really tried everything to motivate this employee and I couldn't motivate them. And then his leader said to him, hey, if you actually sat down and spoke to her, you would realize that, you know, her, her husband is a multimillionaire and she's not motivated by money but by, you know, being part of something where she can make a, a, a massive impact. So knowing your yeah. team members are always important. And as you said, everyone has different motivational factors. And just the last last questions I have for you is, is the quick fire questions. And then I will ask the question from the previous guest. So, so some questions I have, I'll start with the first one. What is your favorite book to read? Oh, my favorite book to read, that would absolutely have to be the da vinci code dan brown i love that book and i will read it over and over and and your favorite movie shawshank redemption amazing and what would be your go-to dish if you had to make a dish for you know a dinner party or some guests oh that would be probably something Indian. I love Indian food, curry. I think it would be that. Or it would be something on the grill, a great big hunk of steak that is cooked perfectly. <laughs> perfect. And you're in the perfect place to, to, to do a lot of barbecues, right? It's nice and warm over in Atlanta. And just lastly, yeah. what, what what's your favorite sports and sports team? I guess this is something we'll probably align on. Yes, you will know it as football. The, the world will know it as football, but here in America, it is soccer. And my favorite team is uh, Atlanta United. I am season ticket holder for uh, since 2017. And uh, my son plays, so he's my second favorite team, whichever team he is on. <laughs> and if you're going to push me for my British team, that would be Tottenham Hotspur. Tottenham? Oh. <laughs> But yeah, and, and lastly, what, what would be a question that you would have for the next guest? And then I'll go ahead and ask you the question. I'll switch up in today's episode. Okay. What is the most interesting project that you have ever been involved with? And what was the outcome? Perfect. And, and the question I have for you from the last guest was, along your leadership journey, what was the biggest challenge that you faced in your personal life? that impacted the decisions you made at work? Um, I think the biggest impact that I had in my personal life that impacted my decisions at work was uh, having my first child. So I, had, I, I was a, a later mum, and so I had been 150% focused on career. And so when I had my first baby, it was how do I get work-life harmony I won't call it balance because I don't think it's ever balanced, but I wanted my work and home life to be, um, to coexist well, effectively. Um, and that then led to me doing some things like carving out dedicated time for the family. So, you know, between the hours of five and seven, when the kids were little, it don't, don't book me for anything. I'm going to be doing dinner, I'm going to be doing bath time, I'm going to be putting them to bed. And I'm not focused on work at all on that. So it was really trying to um, identify what the boundaries were um, to, to be effective. And it took, it took a while to get that rhythm going, actually. It wasn't an yeah. overnight switch. But it's, it's something I, I can resonate with. It's something that I implement at the moment as well when I'm at home. Five till, well, I wouldn't say five, but from six till eight, I tend to spend those t those hours with the family doing bath time and dinners and helping out around the house. And then once everyone's in bed, like you probably have to do as well in your job, 
open up the laptop again and, and you're cracking on for a few more hours, making sure that everything you need to to get done is is done, especially if you're working with many many teams. But yeah, Sarah, I'd, I'd love to thank you again for for your time. It's been more than a pleasure. It's been an enjoyable conversation, some amazing insights, and I'm sure um, a lot of listeners will have a lot to take away from it. And for on on another note, I hope you have a great week. Um, good luck in your endeavours, um, and I'm sure you'll have. Uh, a, a great opportunity next and I'll, I'll be following to see where you land um, but I would recommend all the listeners to follow you on LinkedIn and listen to some of those influential posts that you are uh, creating every day. How Thanks many so is much, it now? Paris. Oh uh, I don't know how many posts off the top of my head but it's you know over a year where I've been regularly and active on LinkedIn yeah. You're doing you're doing amazing, so well thank you again and, and hopefully the, the work in the background is, is is completed soon as well. Thanks so much, Paris. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. No problem. You take care now. Thanks. Bye bye.